Story number five, Chris the Electrician and Rick the Electrified. My brother Christopher was a pretty smart guy. He always did well in school and was a graduate of Pontiac Protestant High School or PPHS while at PPHS. In addition to the required subjects of English, French, science, and math, Chris studied trades. From what I remember, he followed two streams. He studied and excelled at auto mechanics and electricity. Hence, after graduation, he truly was a well-rounded jack of all trades. He was a great mechanic, a pretty good plumber, and definitely understood house wiring and electricity. Thank goodness he was well versed in all matters electric, because he indeed got me out of a few zap moments during the course of my life. This story will explore some funny electrical mishaps I have had, and especially later on in life due to Chris' knowledge of electrical connections. I was fortunate to have him to come to my rescue. Chris never did become a certified electrician, but his knowledge and watchful eyes over a little brother sure were important. I hope you enjoy these few episodes of time well spent with my brother Chris. Episode 1. When I was a young lad, I most certainly had some funny notions in my head. In our home's basement, my parents had stored an old-fashioned radio. I suppose it was broken and was put down there for future repair. I loved looking at this old radio in its beautiful case. In my thinking, this old radio, if plugged in, would not broadcast the crappy music of the 1960s or early 70s. It would transmit classics from the 1940s and 1950s. It was old, so it must play old-time music. I felt all I had to do was just plug it in and I would have instant old-time music. The problem was, however, that its cord had no plug part on it. It only had bare wires. Hey, no problem, I thought. I would just roll up and push these wires directly into the outlet without issue. What did I do? I grabbed the cord, took the bare copper wires by their ends and shoved them into the outlet. Zap! The jolt knocked me to the floor. Chris, who was upstairs in the kitchen, heard the commotion and came running quickly down the basement stairs to find me. He quickly assessed my state of shock and predicted that I was probably okay despite my mishap. He gathered the first aid kit and bandaged my slightly burned fingers. When he confirmed that I was probably going to be okay, he then joked with me about how stupid I was. He hoped that I had learned a valuable lesson about electricity and added that now that I had been zapped, I would probably always have this new wavy hair until it eventually fell out. Oh well. If only Chris had had his electrical trade studies completed at this time. If he had, I am sure he would have put a new end on that radio cord or locked his little brother out of the basement and I would have truly enjoyed that old time music. Episode 2. Later as a teenager, I had a toaster episode. Once again, in this episode, Chris was my savior. I, like any other typical teenager, was making breakfast for myself. I had dreamed the night before of having an ever so delightful breakfast of cinnamon toast. This was a treat for most of us kids. It consisted of buttered, sugared, and cinnamon covered toasted bread. Usually we would cut our toasted and buttered bread slices into four parts and then stack these pieces one by one to build a sugar cinnamon log cabin. This tradition was something taught to us by our mother and as such made breakfast of cinnamon toast even more special. Anyhow, on this particular morning, my pieces of toast got stuck in the toaster. They were starting to burn and I feared the wrath of dad should I accidentally set the house on fire. What should I do? I quickly ran to the kitchen cutlery drawer and grabbed a fork from there to save my toast. I ran to the toaster and jabbed my fork deeply into it, but not into the toasted bread. I hit the live wires with my fork. Zap! I got the second shock of my life and fell to the floor. The toaster and fuse in the fuse box burned out. Chris, who was upstairs resting, quickly ran down to see what was up. He found me laid out upon the kitchen floor. After his quick examination, he found me alive and well, although a bit frazzled. Knowing that I was okay, once again he teased, Oh brother, when will you learn? Please never play around with electricity, he said. He had reminded me then of the episode years ago in the basement with that old radio and teased. Do you really want all of that nice wavy hair to fall out? Thank you, Chris, for once again making sure I was still alive and well. Again, this event happened before Chris studied electricity in school. As such, if it had happened after his studies, I am sure he would have installed a better baby brother safe outlet in the kitchen. Oh, the toast, though a bit burnt, was very yummy. Episode 3 With the shock from the toaster zap long forgotten, time passed, and we were now a few years ahead of that time. Now it was Christmas time, and I had the task of installing the electric Christmas lights to the roof of the front our father's business, Gauthier's Garage. 
Chris and I had driven to Shawville that morning and had purchased new strings of Christmas lighting to be used along Dad's garage and equally to be installed along the front of the house veranda. Installation of Christmas lights, I felt, should be easy enough because with the aid of Dad's aluminum extension ladder, I could easily reach all areas where we wanted to put lights. Most importantly, there were electrical outlets at the peak of the garage roof and also on the front porch veranda for eventually connecting the new Christmas lights to electricity. With the newly purchased Christmas lights in my hand, I excitedly ascended Dad's 24-foot aluminum ladder. There was no chance of falling because I had firmly jammed the ladder sturdily into a snowbank. So up I went, swinging the string of lights proudly. Once I reached the top of the ladder, I decided it would be best to perhaps plug them into the outlet to ensure that there were no burnt bulbs. Why install a string of lights with burnt bulbs, I thought. Good decision, right? I plugged the lights in and the whole string shined beautifully. There was not one burnt bulb to replace. Yippee, I screamed down to Chris. All lights work. I will now go ahead and start stapling them to the roof line. How excited I was to install these beautiful lights. I stared at the peak and with my trusted staple gun began to place each light into place until staple, staple, zap. I had accidentally stapled directly through the live wire of the Christmas lights. I felt dizzy and got a second zap because I then touched the aluminum ladder with wet hands while still holding onto the live string of lights. This last zap sent me tumbling to the ground from way up the ladder. Luckily it was winter time and I fell directly into a hefty soft snowbank. My brother Chris, who was watching all the buzz unfold from below, ran to me quickly. He shook me, praying aloud that I was okay. I opened my eyes and brushed the snow away and told him that despite the unexpected battery charge, I was truly okay. Knowing that I was fine, he smirked and said, this makes three events with electricity, you silly brother. He warned me that I better be more careful and more respectful of the power of too many watts because if not all my hair would fall out before I turned 20. Oh, oh. Episode 4 In the early years, when I was a young child, our mother cooked our meals on a wood stove. We had a huge cook stove assembled in the middle of mother's kitchen. I remember this so well because its stovepipe poked through the kitchen ceiling directly into the boys' bedroom directly above the kitchen where my brothers and I slept. On cold winter nights, we would move ourselves as close as possible to the stovepipe for extra warmth. At one point in the late 1960s, the wood cook stove got replaced by a newer second-hand electric stove. What a change for mother and for us children. With the electric range, we no longer needed to go out to the woodshed to cart in armfuls of wood to keep the kitchen stove fire burning. Anyhow, this stove worked well when cooking food on top from any of its four electric elements. I chuckle when I think of the word elements, because when we were kids we would refer to these as lids. I do believe this term that defines the electric range elements in our home came from our mother, or perhaps it was our grandmother who referred to them as lids. The term was used when they, the primary cooks of the house, had used our wood cook stove previously. The cooking areas of the wood stove were covered with cast iron lids. As such, even though the wood stove was gone, the term lids lived on in our home. Though the newer stove was now electric, the term lids stuck in our Gauthier vocabulary. As mentioned, all four elements worked great, but because the stove was secondhand, often the wires or fuses for the oven did not work well. On one particular day, I was preparing a cake to be baked and the oven shorted out. My brother Chris and I decided that we could probably fix the issue, and hence we shoved the stove forward to have access to its back. We unscrewed the back panel and carefully examined the insides to determine what was causing the oven to not function. Chris warned me to be super careful because the stove used 220 volts. I promised him I would be careful. We discovered that a wire was disconnected from the stove fuse panel. It also looked like the fuse may have burnt out and would need to be replaced. So our plan was that Chris would go to the storage area in the kitchen to get a new fuse. And I, yes, I, the stupid one, while impatiently waiting for his return, grabbed the bare wire to see why it was disconnected. Zap! I once again took a jolt of electricity. This time there was no falling from the shock or silliness, I just got zapped and zapped pretty hard. Chris came running to assess my state and saw, thankfully, that I had not held on to the silly wire so long as it would have really jolted the life out of me. Chris the wise one then asked, why did you not unplug the stove? Oops, I replied, I guess that was a pretty important step. I did tease him, however, especially because he was the guy who was taking a trade in electricity at school. 
and he should have reminded me. He was the wise one, yet he did not warn that unplugging an appliance was a pretty important step. We then unplugged the stove and Chris with his expertise changed the weird wire with a new one and put in a new fuse. What was the result? Well, there was one slightly crispy brother, me, one very intelligent brother, Chris, and a lovely baked pineapple upside down cake for dessert after supper that night. Episode five. Since the oven episode, a few years had gone by and thankfully the oven never shorted out again. By now, I had graduated from high school, completed an intensive business education program in Hull, Quebec, had permanently moved to Ottawa, had rented my own apartment, and was steadily working. I had a lovely apartment which was bright and clean, but soon discovered it could become very hot inside it during the summer months. At this time, air conditioning was not common in older apartment buildings and buying a portable window unit was way beyond my budget. As such, I had bussed up to Canadian Tire and purchased an amazing ceiling fan. I dreamed the whole bus ride home of finally having a brisk ocean breeze blowing over my bed that night. I was feeling great. I had made one of my first bigger appliance purchases and was pretty confident that I could install it without issue. Oh yeah? No. Did I mention that these ceiling fans work on electrical current and they don't get simply plugged into an outlet? I soon figured out these facts once I had opened up the box and unpacked the pieces. I tried to read the foreign language instructions. They were in English and got more and more confused. I had to attach fan blades with locking bolts, had to connect its lamp attachment to the motor, and it seemed that I had to connect several wires from the unit to direct power. Oh, oh, okay, take a deep breath, I said, you can do this. I studied the diagram again and it illustrated black, white, and green wires. It told me that I could simply connect these wires to their similar counterparts, which apparently were to be found within a standard ceiling fixture. Oh, I see. Okay, out came my ladder and I climbed up to reach the fixture above my bed. I started to undo the screws and I had a vision of Christopher in my head. It said, Rick, shut off the power, turn off the breaker or take out the fuse before proceeding. Thanks to my vision of Chris in my memories, this was a very smart call. You see, Chris had finally helped me learn the lesson after all. Okay, back to the story. I checked the breaker box and I switched off the breaker that was labeled ceiling. Up the ladder I went once again, and with a few twists of the screwdriver, the old light fixture was dangling in my hand. I pulled it down to get a better look. Oh no, there were no white, black, and green wires. All of them were black and I was not even lucky enough to have a red one. Could I figure this out? I thought I could try. I screwed loose one of the Meridi connectors and touched the connection to make sure it was dead. Zap! Thank goodness this time it was neither another radio in a basement nor a stapler in a barehanded teenager on an aluminum ladder incident, but I did definitely had another zap. First step, go look in the bathroom mirror to make sure all your hair had not fallen out. Second step, call your brother Christopher, the expert for some advice and direction before continuing. The next day my brothers Chris and Bernie came for a visit because I really needed Christopher's help. Chris came prepared with all his school notes and wiring diagrams. Chris asked me to describe to him the type and configuration of the wires that were inside the ceiling fixture. After some study of his notes and some reflection about the situation, he was able to determine that one of the wires fed through that box was still hot because it fed another circuit or fixture somewhere in the apartment. The solution, he said, was to temporarily shut off all the breakers to avoid any more shocks. Boy, was he a smart guy. Next he had me use a tester device that he had brought with him to totally confirm that the power was indeed off. Knowing this, Chris gave me the all clear that it was now safe to remove the old ceiling fixture. While I was doing this, he studied the ceiling fan electrical diagram and compared it to his school notes. He was able to quickly figure out to which wire I was to connect the fans, black, white, and green ones. Soon the fan was connected correctly and secured safely top the ceiling. We turned all breakers back on and clicked the wall switch. The magic swoosh of the fan from above was thrilling. The new cooler air soon refreshed us while we shared a celebratory lunch of ham and cheese sandwiches and cold drinks. As we ate, Chris teased me, saying now that you have a nice breeze, Rick, you had better sweep the floor because apparently he could see dust bunnies jumping under my bed and behind my couch. What a guy. I love you, Chris. I miss you. Episode 6 How many more times could my brother Chris come to my rescue? Could he finally keep me from being zapped ever again? Well, not yet. Time carried on for both Chris and I. I continued my life in Ottawa, working and keeping out of trouble. Chris continued to live back home and look after our mother, 
along with the help of our brother Bernard. After having lived for nearly two decades in Ottawa, I was fortunate to purchase and move into a lovely home in the Hintonburg neighborhood. This home, in my view, was just perfect in size and style. The bonus was that it also had a great backyard with an in-ground pool, which featured a pool cabana shed that also served as my workshop. This little building was originally a car garage, but the former owner had it cut in half to enable the installation of the pool. To run the pool equipment within, the pool shed had an electrical power source connected to it by way of an underground cable from the house. After a few years at the house, I decided that the interior cabana walls needed an upgrade because I wanted to truly transform the front of the building into a changing room for friends when they would come over for a swim. This would limit the number of bathers traversing through the house with wet feet. Anyhow, I purchased new paneling and molding trims to spruce up the front of the cabana. I easily measured each wall and skillfully cut the paneling pieces to the lengths, heights, and shapes I needed. I also measured very accurately the spots required for the door, the window, and all electrical switches and outlets. Next, it was time to affix the paneling into place. The first part of the interior that was refaced was the wall with the door and window. The paneling was installed like a charm. I nailed it securely to the wall and it looked really great. I then held the next piece into its place, put a nail in my hand, grabbed my metal hammer, hit the nail, and zap. I had put a nail directly through a power wire that was hidden within the walls of the shed. I did indeed get a pretty good zapping once again, and it made me jump back with a jolt. This mishap also caused all the power to the shed to be cut off. Oh, oh, I had visions of Chris telling me, why Rick did you not use a wire finding tool to locate any live wires? Even better were his words, why dear brother had you not turned off the electricity? Oh, oh, I had a problem and I knew just who to call. I soon connected with Chris and he first laughed. Then he explained in detail what I would need to do. He then teased me by asking, are you confident you can do this with you being down there in Ottawa and me up here in Otter Lake? Yes, I said. Okay, he said, and then joked, are you bald yet? Any wavy hair left on your head? You have helped me out of electrical jams several times now, so I think I will be okay, I said. However, once I get back from the hardware store with the supplies you told me to get, I may need to call you back later for more help, I continued. Then I joked, oh yes, Chris, I still have hair on my head. So off I went to the hardware to buy a new piece of electrical wire, a couple of junction boxes in case I needed them some Marite connectors, and an electronic scanning device to detect live wires behind walls. Chris had explained that I would need to trace the wire I damaged from its connection box to its destination. It could be to a light fixture or to a switch box or to an outlet. The first thing to do was to absolutely make sure the breaker for the cabana was indeed turned off. Next, I needed to remove the existing wall covering to find and inspect the damaged wire. All necessary wall covering was removed. I found the wire and as Chris suggested, I traced it from the wall switch to a light fixture in the ceiling. Now to make sure I was doing this correctly, I called Chris once more. He coached me to open up the light switch and use my screwdriver to remove the wire from its connectors. With his encouragement, I did the same for the light fixture. Next, I was to remove the damaged wire, nail and all. Chris advised that I was to cut a new piece of wire to a tiny bit longer than the old one that I had removed. I was not to pull the wire too tight in the new installation. Next, Chris told me to run the new wire through exactly the same holes in the wall studs and ceiling joists. I did just that. Once the wire was in place, I could prepare the wire ends by stripping off about one centimeter of their casings for each internal wire and bend and reattach these white, black, and green ends to the wall switch. The same procedure was copied to reattach the light fixture equally to the new wire. Now both the light switch and ceiling fixture could be screwed back into their existing junction boxes. I asked Chris about the extra new junction boxes I had purchased and what to do with them. He simply told me that I needed to be prepared and had me buy those in case I had messed up the original ones with my good workmanship. Finally came the moment of truth. I returned to the main circuit breaker and turned the power back on. Yeah, everything came back to life in the pool cabana. We once again had lights, electricity to the outlets, and most importantly, power once again to run the pool pump. Now that I knew where the wiring was located behind the walls, the rest of my pool shed renovations came off without another hitch or shock.
The changing area looked just great, beer fridge and all. What did I do with the extra junction boxes? I gave them to Chris that year for Christmas. He laughed and said, come on over here for a hug. Then quipped, hey, Rick, you still have most of your hair. Last words. Thanks for listening to this silly story. Did Chris become a certified electrician? No, he was a great small engines mechanic. Did I ever get zapped again? No. Did we enjoy these adventures and the brotherly bonds that developed? Absolutely, yes. Oh, by the way, I am now practically bald.